Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's uh, Olympus Inspection 360 webinar. I'm so glad that you've all joined us. Uh, I've been really excited about the webinar that we're going to have today with our uh, guest speakers um, on a very, a very important topic. And so I'm glad you've joined us. Look forward to uh, the research we're going to hear about and also the conversation that uh, we'll follow afterwards. Uh, I'm Michael Hall. I'm uh, one of the x-ray specialists at Olympus. And I'm, my role today is basically just, just moderator or MC, um, and uh, I don't want to take much uh, airtime away from Professor Richter uh, and uh, Ms. Caglieri, uh, Caglieri, who's the student researcher. So with that, let's, uh, let's jump right in today's topic about urban soils and human impacts. And uh, this, this concept of human impacts is a bit of two directions. Uh, what is the impact of humans upon the soil? And what's the impact of the soil up, uh, upon humans? And in particular, we're looking at uh, lead contamination uh, in communities. So thank you for joining today. And we've got a, a world-renowned expert to help lead us through this, this discussion. I did just want to uh, mention who we are as Olympus. Um, uh, some of you may be familiar with Olympus for their, their digital cameras or, or in, in past their you know, film-based cameras. Uh, this is the same, same Olympus uh, organization, also make uh, microscopes and uh, we're a meta global medical technology company with uh, a lot of endoscopy and therapeutic solutions. But we also have uh, industrial technology as well, which is what uh, the x-ray technology we'll be talking about today. Uh, but the the purpose of Olympus, our, our company's purpose is to make lives healthier, safer, and more fulfilling. And so whether it's more fulfilling by capturing that family photo, uh, or healthier through uh, endoscopy and therapeutics, or safer through our industrial technologies, uh, the inspections that we provide, this is the, the mission that um, unifies the technology that Olympus develops. And I think if you uh, if you think about these concepts of safe, healthy, and fulfilling, uh, there's a lot of things that can be put in the center of this, the overlap of this, but I think uh, the concept of urban soils uh, definitely fits in there. We want soils to be safe. We want the soil to be healthy for itself and healthy for our communities so that whether we are gardening or playing on the playground, uh, we can have a safe and, and fulfilling life. And so this is part of the connection to our topic today to uh, Olympus's mission. We will be uh, uh, talking about several topics uh, uh, connected to lead in soils, but uh, one of the technologies involved in this will be x-ray fluorescence. I know many of you on on this presentation day may not be familiar with x-ray fluorescence at all. So I'll just give a, a quick uh, tutorial in terms of how this works. This is a handheld instrument, uh, portable. Many people compare it to like a, a radar gun uh, that a you know law enforcement might use, so similar format there. Uh, it is x-ray based, so x-rays come out from the, the instrument and go into the sample, into the soil sample, rock sample, whatever sample you might be analyzing. Those x-rays go out of in the, from the instrument into the sample. The sample then absorbs those x-rays and the uh, sample becomes energized. The iron in that sample, the chromium in that sample, the nickel in that sample become energized. It's similar to, um, you know, sort of giving a, you know, a sugar drink to a toddler. The, the elements become quite energized there. And what they do is then in return give, give off their own x-rays. But the x-rays that come back are different than the x-rays that went out. So the x-rays of iron look different than the x-rays of chromium, which look different than the x-rays of nickel, of lead, of mercury. And so these x-rays are a, a fingerprint of the material's composition. From there, the technology works similar to your digital camera. There's a detector, there's a microprocessor that converts these uh, photons or x-rays into a digital signal um, and does really, you know, does a lot of fancy math in, in, in the background to ultimately give you uh, material chemistry, how much arsenic or cadmium or chromium or lead is in this sample, how much iron or quartz or um, uh, aluminum might be in this sample. And all of this happens basically at the speed of light where we're talking about two to three seconds, 20 seconds maybe max. Um, so quite, quite fast, completely non-destructive, safe, handheld, portable. And uh, this technology undergirds part of the research that Professor Richter and uh, Ms. Caglieri will be talking about uh, in their presentation today. 
So I do want to introduce uh, Professor Richter, and I'm very grateful for him to commit his time today uh, to this presentation. He's a professor of soils and forest ecology in the Nicholas School of Environment at Duke University, and he holds dual appointment in the Earth and Climate Science Department, as well as the Environmental Science and Policy Department. And I think this dual appointment reflects uh, his long-standing commitment to thinking not just about the hard science of soils and um, and ecology and forest science, but also thinking about uh, how do we take that science and translate it into policy and practices that uh, help our environment and our community. Um, and so he stands at the intersection of both of those things. Uh, he's been directing the Calhoun um, Soil Ecosystem Experiment for many years. This is a 60 year outdoor ex uh, experiment that's been going on and he's been associated with this for almost half of uh, the Calhoun um, uh, Soil Ecosystems Experiment there. Uh, formerly was at Oak Ridge National Lab and uh, I'm certainly not a soil scientist but as I um, you know uh, read up on Professor Richter's research one of the th concepts that popped out is this idea of Anthropocene soil. I don't know if you coined this term yourself, Professor Richter, but I know it's central to your research. The idea that uh, the soil uh, is is uh, living within the human epic, that the, the human uh, have, have impacted the soil and the soil have impacted humans and we live um, uh, in synergy with, with one another. And I think that's certainly central to our, our concepts today. Uh, if you want to uh, get to know Professor Richter more and his research, if you Google either of these here, Implications for Soil Health from the Soil Health Institute, or a nice interview he did with British Soil Science, this is a good uh, general introduction to Professor Richter. Uh, these slides will be available afterwards, and we can share those, those links with you as well. He'll be joined today by Miss Julia Caglieri. I've had the privilege of knowing Julia for actually a couple years now. Uh, she's one of these uh, high achieving individuals that makes you feel like you haven't done enough with your life, um, but she's uh, already um, uh, made quite an impact on science. She's uh, a double major in mechanical engineering and environmental science at Duke University, and uh, uh, is a two-time uh, national and international science fair winner. Um, all before going to college. So it gives you, give you a sense for Julia's um, work ethic and, and ambition in the STEM sciences. Um, and if you want to find out more about Julia, you can um, follow a couple of these links or, or Google them. She's already had two published publications uh, prior to starting her research with Professor Richter. Uh, so without further ado, I want to turn it over to Professor Richter and Ms. Caglieri for today's presentation. Well, I'll be back on at the end to take questions. Feel free to put any comments or questions you have in the uh, attendee chat as we go along. So thank you, Michael, very much uh, for this opportunity and um, actually for the opportunity of working with Julia because it was it was only you and your colleagues that, that put the two of us together. Julia is only a first year student at Duke and uh, oh my gosh. Uh, so wonderful to work with somebody who comes in as a first year student with experience uh, with XRF. So she's she in short order has made impact on our on our work. Uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, Julia, would you like to say, I don't know, formally a, a hello? <laughs> uh, hi, um, Michael, thank you for having us. I'm super excited about this. And um, Dr. Richter and I and the rest of the, the lab team have done a lot of really cool work, so I'm excited to share that today. Yeah, great to, great to see you, Julia. And um, so in, in the university, uh, the, the, the wonderful thing about being able to do uh, research is, is the, the wonderful students that keep coming. <laughs> and Julia is just, she doesn't know it, but she's one in a long parade of uh, absolutely wonderful students that uh, that come through Duke and come through the university systems, and uh, and two other students or three other students here I have listed. Anna Wade was a recent PhD graduate, and she and I began this soil lead work with our XRF in Durham. 
um, and is now employed by the EPA. Uh, Annie Barreri is a, a master's student uh, whose work uh, Julia and Rhett Grewell and I are, are helping move along. And we'll talk a little bit about our early um, data from Annie's work. But for the most part, uh, this comes from an environmental science and technology published paper. It's an open access paper. And if you were to Google just, uh, I don't know, Wade, Richter, <laughs> Durham, lead, you, you would find the paper in short order. So if you're really interested in what we're doing here, um, our slogan, our lab has a slogan. Um, it's every, every city needs a soil lead map. And we're, we're not literal there, but we, we are uh, very earnest about that slogan. Every city needs a soil lead map because What's happened to our little project within Durham is it's it's led me to all of the all of the city agencies that have anything to do with 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 the environment or with waste or or even the fire department because there's huge uh, there's high level concentrations of lead in 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 much of the paint that's on our our fire hydrants and um, in in any event it's you know every soil every city needs a soil lead map it's a it's uh, it's uh, it's a bit facetious, but on the other hand, it's uh, just having a little project like this becomes uh, not just research; it becomes an environmental education project. So, thank you, uh, Olympus. I guess you could say for uh, opening this opportunity to uh, to the scientific world. Because, uh, for example, I'm I'm a wet chemist. I'm a wet lab chemist. I. And I've been so thrilled to have this XF that, that increases the speed at which soil samples move through my lab by at least 100 times. And the concentrations uh, range over five orders of magnitude. It's, it's really spectacular what technology is, 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 is allowing um, my generation of scientists to do. And then just to think about Julia's generation, I mean, it's, it's really spectacular. Uh, science doesn't give us all the answers, but it, it certainly gives us a lot of tools and a lot of insight. So to, just to conclude this uh, first slide of Durham, North Carolina, the bull city, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a project in which we've made visible the invisible. Uh, legacy lead is, is out there in city environments, uh, and this... Uh, Particularly, this instrument gives us the ability to, to be confident, uh, either using it in portable mode or, or back in the lab, which we greatly prefer. Uh, you know, we're making visible uh, some problems that have have been has, have been forgotten, basically have have not been looked at. Now, I remember exactly the pair of maps that that startled me, uh, that made me think, I have, I have, I can do something here particularly with my students. This is a very fascinating topic. And this, this, is a, this is a map made by Howard Milkey. He's 85 years old. He has more energy. He has as much energy as Julia, I'll tell you that. He's 85. He, he has worked in uh, Tulane University's medical school mapping, mapping city soils of, um, of their uh, legacy metal concentrations. And, and his, here is his hometown in New Orleans, and you can see the soil lead map and the various concentrations in the, in the legend at the bottom right. You can see that the old quarter of New Orleans is just, uh, just the hot spot for lead now in, 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 in these different neighborhoods. Now he's repeated this analysis since about 1990, uh, but the startling a startling comparison was with children's blood lead in these same neighborhoods. And I'm going to show you the blood lead map, which is basically the same map as, as the soil. Here's the blood lead map. I dare you to kind of look at those two, two maps and say there's much difference. And so Howard's been on a, on a 35, 40 year career. He's finally retiring. Um, and um, this is this is basically his life's work. Um, and when I when I saw those two these two maps, I'm I'm just startled. Um, and, and and to realize that my colleagues in the soil chemistry uh, profession at large, hardly any of us work in the city. 
And yet here, here are the soils that are closest to us as human beings. Um, and so more about this soil, more about this story uh, and, and, and the correlation here uh, as we move through this. A little bit more of the history of lead, uh, it, at least in America, um, lead, it, we, we, I've, I've used the word legacy lead, it's because uh, the circulation of lead in, in the contemporary cities of America today is much less than it ever has been. Decades are passing by, so that's the good news. And so you can see lead in fresh paint. Uh, that's about half of the lead that was, has been brought into the urban environment, and the other half comes from leaded gasoline. Lead was taken out of gasoline in America by the early 1980s and uh, really represents a big pulse in the 1970s, though. About a quarter of all the lead that was added to our city environments was added in the 1970s in leaded gas. But the good news is we've got it out of these project products. It's been out of the products for 40 plus years. Uh, but the problem, the bad news, is the chem has to do with the chemistry of lead. It is, it is very insoluble, highly insoluble especially in the soil environment. And so it, it accumulates in the soil environment um, and it tends not to dissolve and leach away like many other chemical elements might, but, but it really becomes, it really is, is held with high affinity for the soil clays, especially in the soil organic matter. And so that's, you know, there's a bit of good news and there's a bit of bad news. Well, the other part of this problem that makes it a very important environmental health problem and it will continue to be such for decades to come is our scientific understanding, our medical understanding of the toxicity of lead. Um, lead is, is known as a non-threshold toxin. You know, there are many, there are many toxins in the environment that uh, they have a, a certain threshold under which they really don't affect you. And then you go over that threshold and then it becomes a, a, a concern to your uh, mental state or to your behavior or to your physical prowess. But lead, even the, the we now believe that, that lead is one of those relatively few toxins where you don't want any of it in your environment. Um, yes, there's a limit to that um, in, in terms of practical livelihood, but we do want to identify uh, where lead is in our city environments and do something about it. And we think, we actually uh, think we're entering a new stage in terms of remediation for lead, and it's a very exciting stage, and I'll try to, try to, to, try to reveal what I mean by that as we move ahead. And I, 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 I might say one last thing about this point. It's all in red here. And so as we have removed lead from paint, from fresh paint anyway, and from gasoline, the medical science community, you can see, has reduced the blood lead concentrations level of concern, let's call it, from 60 of these units, micrograms of lead per deciliter uh, of blood, from 60 down to five and now they say not only five that's just a target it's not that's not a safe level uh for blood lead level and so um cdc is has recently had a, a working group recommend that five uh it be lowered to, to three uh and um, in any event it's um at the same time we've taken out lead from these from most products, not all, still in some uh, water systems, uh, some other uh, forms of lead still uh, are actively bringing lead into the human environment. But from the big two sources here, gasoline and paint, it's been out of the out of circulation for a number of decades, and that really has a has had a huge effect on exposure. Uh, the, another good news story is that exposures are way down compared to what they were uh, during the 1970s in the urban environment, for example. But the, the underside, the, the, the complexity is that medical scientists are now more and more uh, realizing that the uh, concentrations, uh, even at low levels, are, can be harmful to, to, uh, to the human body. 
Now, our overarching hypothesis is that as these decades go by, city soil lead concentrations, soil lead concentrations are decreasing. That's our hypothesis, and that's in response to the fact that soils are living, they get mixed, they erode away, uh, and this, 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 uh, high, the high amounts of lead that were added by both fresh paint and, and, and aging paint and also gasoline are slowly dissipating. Uh, we don't know what, at what rate because we have no observations, except for good old Howard Milky. Uh, the, the recently retired medical doctor, soil chemist, um, and his papers, uh, he, he basically that New Orleans data set in which he's repeatedly sampled the soil, of, of soil in New Orleans can quantify the decreasing rate. Well, it's our overall hypothesis, uh, and it's, it's not really, remember, it's not really saying the problem is entirely going away, but it's definitely... Um, definitely leading us into a new era of soil lead remediation in the city. All righty. If I was to teach a course in soil science, I might use this kind of diagram. And it's what we call the natural model of soil. Um, and, and it's due to Roy Simonson's, it's, it's, uh, it's a cartoon of, of, of soil processes creating soil in the natural environment. Well, in the city environment where my colleagues do not study, and I have only started to study soil in the city for four or five years, um, we, need to, we need to modify this model and bring it into the city environment. This is a natural way of looking at the soil. Uh, and so my student, Anna Wade, did her best to, to take Simonson's process model uh, and, and adapt it to uh, soil, soils of the city and also adapt it to the lead problem. And so we're, in a sense, we're using lead to tell us about how so soils work in the city. And so, of course, on the left, we have what Simonson uh, did was he said there are inputs into soil. And so here's a VW bug from the 1970s. You know, it, it was really appalling the amount of lead that was being circulated in American cities. It was also in fresh paint and an aging paint. So here's the 2020s. The uh, legacy lead from gasoline is now in the soil, insoluble. Uh, and, and the older homes of Durham and of other cities uh, also uh, are still, the exterior paint is still contributing some lead to the localized environment around the, around the older homes. Of course, we have inputs from composting and yard fill. We have mixing uh, of cut and fill and construction. We have translocations like trees tip up and mix the soil. We do have some leaching. It's not a very big process. Some, some urban areas have trees in city parks that, that cover the soil with leaves. That's a good thing. Uh, and then we have transformations, different kind of chemical reactions that either stabilize or make more bioavailable the, uh, the legacy uh, metals. And then we have outputs as well. And so over decades of time, erosion is moving lead off the land, off the city uh, surfaces into local uh, floodplains. But in any event, our hypothesis is that these processes are contributing to a slowly decreasing concentration uh, of soil lead. And um, my colleagues and I want to sample, want to resample six or eight U.S. cities that have been sampled in the past, much like Howard Milkey's work, and expand that New Orleans work out to six or eight American cities. That's our ambition. And maybe I'll be lucky enough to have a student like Julia work on that with me. All righty. Let's, let me show you something about our, our uh, study, just a couple of slides about Durham. Um, I was new at this, so I needed, a, I needed an environment where I could work with students and we could learn together. So we went over to the east campus of Duke University, and we basically started uh, at this intersection, point zero, and we collected a soil sample every 100 meters as we walked around the perimeter of east campus. And we took two samples, one at the street side, um, right next to the street, half a meter away from the street. And then we, we walked, I think it was, um, yeah, it was about 10 to 15 meters 
uh, inside the street, but we paired the samples. We had one that was street side and one 50 meters in, 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 the, uh, in the grassy uh, areas of, of, of East Campus. And you can see the data over here. Uh, it, you know, it, it's been 40 or 50 years. So there's been uh, mixing and, and gardening and, and the grounds crew at Duke has taken care of some of the, some of the street side soils. They brought in um, uh, new soil. And, and so you have low, lower levels and then you have other constant other street side soils that are really rather high a thousand parts per million we had one corner there broad and markham way up in the northeast we've repeatedly sampled that and that intersection has three old gas stations on three of the four corners and we assume that that's from some kind of leaking uh some kind of leak that went into the that corner uh, of of northeast on, on east campus We've repeated those data, but that's 3,000 parts per million. That's 10 times what EPA says is a safe level. And in fact, uh, most of us soil chemists think that EPA's level of safe lead at 400 ppms needs scrutiny and lowering. So that's considerable amount of lead there that still exists 40, 40 years after, uh, after lead was taken out of gas. And so, yeah. So let me move on here. We can either, my, my, my uh, let's see, yeah, Kevin Tan, who is an undergrad, uh, he, he, he said, let me take that data and, and let me, let me uh, make a three-dimensional uh, graph of it. And so here's what it is. Kevin and I worked at the southeast corner of East Campus, and we took our uh, XRF for the first time. We uh, took it to the field. Uh, Michael and his colleagues claim that it's portable, and it really is. And we, what we did was we walked around this uh, southeast campus uh, lawn. We know that it's been a lawn for 50, 60, 80 years, uh, and we could still see the legacy uh, lead right around the uh, right around the perimeter of that lawn. Uh, and we could we detected you know hundreds of parts per million in in some cases but the inter internal part of that lawn is is uh, you know 50 50 parts per million or less and when 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 i read the literature about aerosol deposition uh, of of the lead particles uh, most of those lead particles the literature tells us uh, were deposited uh, quite quickly some of them went into the general atmosphere and and moved long distances of course uh, but most of that lead burden was deposited uh, close to the streets. Uh, and, and that's what it appears here that was uh, verified 40 years after uh, 40 years after lead was taken out of gas. The, another thing we did was we decided to expand that. And we I had more fun on this in this class. I, I held a class uh, to do this work and I took my six students and we walked 26 miles of, of Durham streets, collecting soil every 100 meters. Um, some of the streets are high traffic flow streets and, high, and some of the streets are, are uh, residential, uh, residential streets. And so here's a concentration map that we were able to generate. And we uh, statistically, the high flow streets like Roxborough and Club uh, and, and West Main for that matter, even though it's been 40 years, those are the streets that still have the highest lead burden still in evidence. Uh, lower traffic streets like Glendale here, uh, they just didn't get the traffic flow. So that signature is still imprinted on the street side soil. Uh, and again, this is uh, within a half a meter of the curb. So it is really literally street side. Um, Anna and I went out and we sampled uh, houses uh, across Durham and the strongest covariate was um, was house age. And we, we sampled two kinds of soils, soils that were within one meter of the foundation. Uh, and and uh, then we took yard samples uh, out across the front and side yards of, of, of uh, I think it was 62 houses. So this is our first, it's really a first estimate, uh, but boy, it gave us uh, the age, uh, house age signal uh, loudly and clearly. Here's the 400 parts per million EPA soil guidance concentration here uh, on this graph. And you can see that a large majority of the older homes, older than 1950, have 
you know, concentrations well above the 400 part per million level. And uh, Anna has added this, there's a soil guidance level two that EPA is considering, and, and they're considering, you know, reducing that concentration of soil lead uh, to 100. That's more of an unofficial, but what, a, what an amazing uh, graph that reveals. And I might say that this is the second city in North Carolina that has, has had a, uh, a study like this. Well, to wrap up, what did we learn? We learned that street side Durham soil still harbors uh, legacy soil lead, uh, especially along streets with high traffic flow. Uh, the average is pretty high, uh, 150, uh, and it's based on a pretty good sample size, 400. Uh, soils adjacent to homes are also uh, issues, uh, have, have issues with lead, very high concentrations, averaging over 600 parts per million, and a pretty good sample size of 200. Uh, and of course, where are kids, uh, kids, uh, especially less than five years old, lack the defenses that even adults have to, to exclude lead from uh, the bloodstream. Uh, children, particularly the very young, younger than these kids, uh, are, are even more susceptible, but kids even up to five, uh, it, it's, it's, it's really a tragedy um, in, in regard to uh, how can you keep kids from playing in the dirt? Um, you know, that's a sad tale. Uh, but in any event, uh, we hypothesize that while soil city lead uh, may be decreasing over the decades, and again, it's a hypothesis, um, if this is the case, then hot spots surely remain hot spots of lead. Lead is so insoluble. And so um, uh, such high soil lead may be increasingly predictable, we think, uh, in a hypothetical situation, in a, with a hypothetical perspective. And it, it, it may, they may represent a relatively small area of the city. So it's, it, a question occurs to us, is soil lead becoming a more remediable problem? If it is, you know, that, that represents a policy choice uh, that becomes easier and easier to make, uh, for sure. And so as we move along, I'm going to turn the mic over to uh, Julia in a moment, but just taking a breath here for a second. Um, Anna graduated in uh, 2020. We uh, continue to be interested in soil. Uh, this is a fascinating topic and it's it's one that has so much potential because um, basically science hasn't been there in the city looking at soils in the ways that we've we've uh, just uh, talked about uh, there are exceptions very important exceptions Howard Milky is one exception uh, New York City has a has a very active group of soil uh, soil scientists, there are uh, really brilliant exceptions. Uh, Baltimore is example, Indianapolis, uh, but they're generally few and far between uh, in comparison to where we all live. You know, every soil, every city needs a soil lead map, as I said before. Well, we got interested um, because of a, a, a master's student, any, um, it, it got got me interested in uh, pursuing uh, a, t a question of, well, where are these hot spots, Dan? She would say, where are these hot spots? And so we, 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 got, we got interested in waste incineration, which is a, was, was a very popular engineering uh, practice um, uh, for uh, managing city waste and household waste uh, for decades. Uh, and uh, we, we learned that there were four parks in Durham that had been waste incinerators run by the city uh, for on the order of 50 years. And so since in 1955 was the time where, where Durham uh, closed these city-run waste incinerators, they were in different neighborhoods. Uh, uh, and so they closed them by about 1950 and very happily old newspaper articles um, pronounce uh, that they were converted to playgrounds and to city parks eventually. Uh, unfortunately, that's a, that's a date where there's not a lot of people that can tell you 
exactly what was going on, but uh, old newspaper articles are, are readily queried in our library, and we have three great newspapers in Durham. They're all online, and uh, so we, we were quickly uh, typing in incinerator to see what we could learn, and we, we learned a lot in a hurry. So we learned that there were two generations of waste incineration in Durham, those pre, pre-1955 and neighborhood incinerators. And we think that many medium-sized cities were like this. 50-foot uh, um, uh, stacks, so the smoke was definitely in the human uh, environment. Uh, and these, in Durham anyway, they, they would burn about 5,000 tons per year. Well, you ask yourself, what about all those so-called ash elements, all those elements that do not volatilize, that become part of the ash, elements like lead, like other metals. In any event, we found in the newspapers a lot of neighborhood uh, complaints about the nuisance of smoke, odor, rodents, dust. And the city was really pressured, ground up from neighborhoods up to uh, do something different than these neighborhood incineration uh, procedures. And so they opened a centralized incinerator in 55, uh, right outside of town. And it was state of the art, so the city was very uh, excited. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna. This, this is an ongoing project, and I'm gonna turn this over to to Julia and have her uh, tell us about herself and and a little bit about how she's worked in our lab. Thank you. Um, so I joined Dr. Richard's lab about six months ago at the beginning of this, um, kind of the start of this new project but I've been working with the PXRF for about three, three and a half years now. Um, and I'm super involved in the new project in Dr. Richter's lab. We're canvassing parks and taking samples, and we've really jumped into that. Um, but my particular area of interest right now, at least, is kind of optimizing this process of using PXRF. Um, so as Dr. Richter mentioned earlier, compared to wet chemistry, the XRF is at least 100 times faster. I venture to say that's maybe a conservative estimate. Um, and with this, a lot of scientists using this today are creating a pucking method. Um, so if you see the, the plastic cylinder on the left side, that would be a soil puck. And it's just a plastic piece covered in thin film and stuff full of soil, which kind of densely compacts it. Um, so traditionally, you would take a soil sample, dry it, grind it up to get a uniform uh, coarse uh, particle, and then smash it into the sample, uh, sample cup and create yourself a puck. Um, and these pucks are, are fine. They're easy to label. They're easy to reuse. So you can do a lot of repeat scanning, which is nice, but they take absolutely forever to construct. Um, less time than so or wet chemistry, but significantly more time than just kind of dumping the content of the dirt onto the, the face of the Olympus um, phantom device. Um, and the, the screen there is covered in a, a thin film to protect the instrument, but we've started just kind of pouring our ground and dried soil samples directly on the face of the machine. Uh, using the lead cap to cover it and just running our tests that way. And we've saved ourselves hours and hours without pucking. Um, and we were pretty sure that this was a, a solid approach, a solid method. We were getting good results, um, but we decided to create a little experiment just to make sure that the time we were saving wasn't compromising our results. So what you see here is a graph comparing the results of using a puck or just pouring directly onto the instrument st um, stage. We have an R-squared value. I think we did about 30, 32 samples, um, and an R-squared value super close to one. Um, so we were really able to optimize this process and move through a significant number of samples much, much faster without compromising any of our results. Um, and this has been something that's been really, really nice for the, the project we're doing in Durham right now with the, the city parks, because we're collecting two, 300 samples per park, and it's something that we're really trying to, to move through quickly. So this has really helped in that respect. Thank you, Julia. So I'm gonna, so the next slide is, is are a couple of examples of, of, of 1950s articles uh, that are, are, are our major way of learning about the, the, uh, the neighborhood city run waste incineration. And so they're both from 1950s. Uh, the picture on the left, it's a little bit hard to see, but that's a bulldozer up there kind of cleaning up the cinder and ash pile that existed in what today is a is about a 10-acre city park in, in a residential area. And so uh, this the details say here, this is Walltown Park, which is our first park we've, we've uh, sampled and analyzed. 
uh, the, the paragraph there tells us that there were 200 or maybe 2,000 truckloads of cinders and ash uh, removed from the park. And then uh, the, the remaining uh, cinders and ash were smoothed across the park. And, and then a topsoil layer was, was added as well. And then benches were, were, were installed. And uh, the city was pretty happy with its, um, you know, in an innocent sort of way, they, they were moving ahead uh, through the 20th century. So um, we're very conscious uh, of the, uh, the, we're taking care that we don't um, al alarm the city. On the other hand, city parks need upgrade and you know, that's, that's where we're going. And let me, let me just share you the excitement of science in process. So these are unofficial data. Here's Walltown Park. Uh, here are the uh, locations uh, of each of the surface soil uh, that we took across the park. Um, and uh, here's a new um, gym facility that's been, been constructed uh, in, in the last 30 years. Um, this this uh, square that's blackened is what we initially thought was the location of the park, uh, of the uh, incinerator. Uh, it might have been a little bit to the north, but it's pretty close. So that was the old incinerator site. Uh, and these are concentrations uh, of lead on across the park. We've taken these data and, and Annie has put them into her uh, GIS um, program and Krieged, Krieged the results, which means interpolated them. And you can see there's a, you know, there's a hot spot that's uh, surrounding the, uh, around the incinerator. And when we, when we interrogate the old aerial photos from the 1940s and 50s, we hypothesize that a lot of the, uh, uh, a lot of the ash and cinders was actually transported to the other side of this creek and moved down to the southern uh, western end of the park. And sure enough, our data kind of are suggestive of that. The intensive horticulture around this building uh, reveals quite low concentrations, which is good. Uh, there are some scattered high points there. Uh, in any event, um, this hot spot over here is, is, a, is a problem area. It's, it's the location of two uh, horseshoe pits that are very popular here. And so we, we've got some concentrations there that are up there in 270 to 450, you know, right around the horseshoe pit. So there again, I, you know, I think we're moving to a, um, a recommendation that this is one park that needs, um, you know, some, some uh, facelift, if I can use that word. So it, we're in process here. And I just, I'll just add, and, and uh, Julia can, Feel free to add anything else. What's the future of our work with this XRF? Definitely want to continue our soil studies in Durham. There are four of these parks that are incinerator that, that, that were originally incinerator, incinerators. Uh, we'll complement those studies with some parks that are not incinerator, ha, have, don't have incinerators in their history. Uh, I have a, a monthly uh, Duke soil lead talks blog. It's a blog of sorts every month. The next one is by Dr. Brett Erickson. Uh, we've had these going for a, a, a number of months. It's on 2nd of February at noon Eastern time. If you want to join in, email me, pr please. Um, uh, yeah, he, he's done amazing work. Um, uh, we want to, as I mentioned before, we have ambitions to resample soils in six or eight American cities in different climates with different soil chemistries, um, uh, city soils, that, cities that have had their soils sampled in the past, so we can investigate the decreases uh, that are occurring in soil lead, the hypothetical decreases, and we always want to work in a way that helps educate the next generation of scientists, just like Julia, amazing. Um, so if you want to, uh, want to follow up, here's a Google and, uh, and an email. Julia, got any last words? I guess I would just say, you know, we're, we're a soils lab, so we're moving, moving forward with the soil in Durham using our XRF, but, um, you know, I've, I've seen XRF in literature used with 
metals, with sands, with different kinds of like food materials. I've done work with different kinds of coal or water. So this is really just, I think, an adaptable instrument, which really kind of makes the possibilities not only like in our lab, you know, intensive, but just some serious opportunity for almost every field of research with SRF, um, which makes it super exciting, I think. Yeah, so how do, you, how do you want to move forward, Michael? Yes, thank you. That was a, a very stimulating presentation, and we've got lots of good comments coming in here. I, uh, I was, uh, you may have saw my head down periodically. I was writing lots of questions. I could, I could dominate the whole uh, Q&A time with my own questions, but uh, we've got really good engagement here from uh, our attendees. I, I wanted to pose uh, a two-part question to you that has come in from several people here. Um, the first part is, you know, uh, you know, sh should everyone just panic and sort of crawl under the table here, or could you give give some maybe guidance around um, what would be some indicators that they should be concerned about their own soil and then go to the next step of testing? Uh, so, what are some indicators for concern, and then uh, if they do see it, what are what are mitigation strategies that are available to them? We have a lot of people on today, I think, who are interested in sort of community farming and urban urban gardening. So uh, if you could speak to those two points, would be great. Yeah, when I think about gardening, gardening in the city is a is a really uh, amazing occupation and a wonderful activity. Um, so each of the contaminant metals um, has different um, potentials for being taken up by plants. Uh, fortunately, lead is a chemical, is a chemical element uh, that plants uh, do not take up uh, very readily. Some of the other metals do, uh, but lead is not one that you typically have to worry about the roots taking up the lead and translocating them up to the fruits. Now, if you're growing a root crop, potatoes, that's another matter. Uh, or if you're growing leafy greens, uh, the splashing of soil particles that might occur onto the foliage is, is of concern. But the internal biomass of leafy greens or above ground fruits and vegetables is not likely to have much lead. Uh, that doesn't go for all of the metals, but a, a recent review paper was just published. It's a very good one, very thorough, that, that is very comprehensive in coverage of the literature and, and really establishes that point that lead is just not taken up by plants uh, very, very readily at all. There are a few species of plants that do take lead up. They're very, um, they're unique and, and, and on their own. So the, I was happy to see this review paper come out. It was just published uh, that, that that, uh, that, that more firmly established that rule of thumb that I've just given um, because there, there is a, uh, there is a, um, uh, there is a, uh, a, a general way of thinking and a general concern about, about soils in the city being rooted by plants taking up lead into the, into the plant biomass. I, th I think that New York City tells gives me at least speaking for myself uh the best roadmap for remediation in cities and and basically uh you know it's it's very very costly soil is very heavy <laughs> it's hard to move soil around um in terms of excavating it and moving it off site uh what i think cities that that have parks like the one we're looking at uh maybe there'll be some excavation here or there but basically it's it's more a matter of coverage. It's more a matter of, of bringing in soil that is geologically, uh, has the geological level of lead, which is 10 or 20 parts per million, and basically covering the surface environment and then stabilizing that environment, either with mulch on top uh, or, or with uh, mulch and, and plants, even better yet. Um, yeah, there, there's there's quite a bit of uh, interest and and quite a bit of help that you could get if you um, either email me or uh, or look online for what New York City is doing. It's one of the best things that New York is doing. Frankly, it's 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 really quite incredible their programs, which have been going for about 10, 10 to fifteen years. 
Thank you. And, and I would point all uh, our attendees to the attendee chat section. If you haven't already found it, there should be a sort of a uh, caption icon in the lower center of your screen. And there's actually a very you know, um, vibrant conversation that's going on right now in our attendee chat section. We have with us uh, George Lozevsky from uh, the New York City Urban Soils Institute. And uh, he's sharing some of his... Um, Case in point. Uh, yeah, some of his work from, from NYC. Can you uh, comment, Professor Richter, on any other metals uh, b besides lead? Um, have, you, have you looked at those at all? Or your, your research hasn't looked at maybe other RICRA metals um, or toxic metals, cadmium, uh, mercury, arsenic, or anything like that? Yeah, and I, I think that this is a question I could maybe uh, encourage uh, some interaction with Julia or somebody like Julia. We bought our instrument specifically look to, to uh, get into the field of, of legacy lead contamination, knowing full well that there's a whole family of metals out there that we brought into our cities that are generally insoluble, most many of them, uh, and that present uh, pr problems uh, across uh, the city. Um, but we, we, we bought our XRF specifically for lead, and we've been slowly looking at our other metals that, that uh, are measured uh, each and every time we push the button. 20 seconds later, we get t total lead. We also get a total estimates of something like a, a t 20 other metals, at least, uh, of interest, of potential interest. Uh, we've slowly expanded our confidence in um, those metals. Uh, I've decided to go kind of slow on this uh, for several reasons, but we, we do know that, for example, arsenic is, is, is as impressive in, in terms of the coral, uh, correlation and the, and the quality control as lead is. Uh, lead we can put on a, linear, um, on a linear line like we showed before, over five orders of magnitude. <laughs> um, I don't know if arsenic it, it, spans uh, over five orders of magnitude, but it may, and it's, it's strongly linear. Several other metals are linear as well. Uh, I've, taken a precaution, I've taken a cautionary approach, but there's definitely an opportunity for somebody like, like a Julia to, to work with us and, and, and work, ac work across the elements and, and make our instrument much more of a, uh, uh, much, much, you know, um, have much broader interest. Uh, our data sets are, are, like I was saying before, automatically accumulating uh, concentrations of, on the order of 20 other elements. Okay. That's great, I that actually, oh, software. sorry, please go ahead, Julia. Um, Dr. Richter mentioned running a long-term science experiment um, in South Carolina. It's basically a pine forest at this point. Um, and we have been looking kind of at that data set to look at elements over time. And I think we saw some really interesting correlations between um, different elements and different kind of depths in the profile uh, with maybe cadmium, magnesium, chromium. So there's definitely an opportunity um, in Durham because the historic like source is particular or predominantly lead. We've really only been looking there, um, but certainly in other in other fields and other work, we've been aware at least of other heavy metals and their correlations. Great. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, your, your comments there, Professor Richter, flowed into a, another question I um, that was posed, and I think you, you partially answered. I want to make sure um, I understood your response well. But the, the question was posed about um, the accuracy and precision of portable XRF for metals other than than lead. And if I understood you correctly, I'll ask you to confirm or or correct. But uh, you're saying when you've expanded your uh, lens to look at other metals besides just lead, you're still seeing very good um, precision in the performance of the XRF. Is that accurate? Yes, there's a there's a small handful of them that we we know are are are, are responding linearly. Um, you know, I I've bought a lot of instrument scientific instrumentation over my time as a scientist, um, and um, one thing I like about this instrument is is the technical support. You think we're being paid, Julia? This is so funny, uh, but I can honestly say that that you know we've we've had uh, several people on the call, uh, Michael, your, yourself included, and you've helped us uh, initiate our studies. 
but then I, I also anticipate as we as we get serious about the other elements, which I want to get uh, our, our I want our lab to achieve that uh, ability by the time we resample uh, cities across America. I want to collect a, a you know that's a much more interesting project if we're going to go to the uh, hassle of uh, of having our colleagues in New York recollect samples. Baltimore, Indianapolis, Los Angeles, Phoenix, um, who'd I leave out? Um, if we're going to collect that kind of sample, we want an XRF that'll, that'll give us 20 elements. And so we'd, we'd have a, a much richer uh, data set. And I can, I can foresee some, co uh, some, some good consultation with, with, with you guys, as well as my colleagues at, uh, in other soil chemistry labs. Thank you for that. We're, we're certainly at Olympus committed to uh, giving customer support. Um, it's, it's something we sort of pride ourselves on and we'll, we'll be happy to support you and, and other, other clients as well. I don't see the questions, uh, uh, Michael, so you're, you're, we're depending on you. Yeah, no worries. I'm, I'm trying to post them, uh, voice them to you as we go along. We did have a question here okay. about, um, well, bioaccessibility related to plants. I, th I think you touched on that in part that you were saying, if I understood you correct, very little of the lead is uptake into the plant itself. Um. Yeah, so that's a that's a, uh, a major area of research, uh, especially among my colleagues. Um, I paid attention to total lead for several reasons. Uh, but I do know that, for example, there's a whole cadre of, of EPA scientists here in the research triangle. There are scientists elsewhere who are trying to take soils and estimate, you know, how much how much of that total lead is bioavailable? That's very important. It's also, from my point of view, a very complicated question. And, and so I'm, I'm quite comfortable here at the present time and in the short term future uh, with with total lead, I'll let others uh, deal with those complexes, complexities of bioavailability. Um, but one of the things that you know, a repeated sample in cities, like has already happened in New Orleans. One of the opportunities that gives you is is to look at the changing bioavailability over time. Uh, if you have a soil archive, or the ch or the changing um, lead chemistry over time, which must be occurring, uh, but is is absolutely a frontier in terms of a scientific question. Yeah. Good question. Um, maybe I just pose to you, uh, Julia, uh, um, can you speak a little bit to just how you got so interested in portable XRF? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm originally from Jacksonville, Florida, um, and I got really involved in science fair in high school and was super passionate about the coastal environment um, and particularly coastal pollutants. Um, so I started research in my sophomore year looking at like remediation techniques for oil spills. Um, and XRF was used a lot um, in, I want to say, the 2008 Deep Horizons oil spill, um, particularly with a professor out of Texas Tech at the time or um, maybe LSU, but um, Dr. David C. Weindorf. Um, and he was looking at using visible infrared spectroscopy um, or near infrared spectroscopy and PXRF to determine oil content of different sands. Um, so I reached out to him. We got talking and uh, kind of finishing up my work on coastal uh, remediation techniques and coastal oil contamination. And then we partnered with a professor from Dickinson State University in North Dakota to start working on a really novel approach to quantifying the sulfur content of lignite coal, um, which is when we really got involved with PXRF. Um, and that's kind of how I came to, to meet some, some people and, and Michael from the Olympus Corporation at a conference in Austin, Texas. Um, and we basically saw that with a little bit of algorithm training, we could use the PXRF in lignite coal to determine sulfur content, which has some serious implications for sulfuric acid. Um, but in doing so, we started kind of trying to adapt PXRF to maybe different mediums that it wasn't necessarily made for. Um, and then my senior year, we again adapted it to a different medium and started working with water and heavy metals 
Um, and that really kind of brought me back to the PXRF and heavy metals. Um, and then when I, I started at Duke, um, I see my flight, I reached out to you and found the Richter lab and haven't really looked back since. So now we're still doing great work with the PXRF and heavy metals. All while great. playing all while playing basketball. Julie is a basketball star. <laughs> wow. She would never she would never tell you that either. Uh, Julia, <laughs> never never lose your humility. It is so wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I'll, I'll just again uh, uh, draw attention to the attendees. Uh, uh, Mr. Lozevsky from again from the New York City Urban Soils Institute put a nice reference about bioavailability uh, into the comments. I've grabbed that reference. Uh, I will send out some resources to follow up, including this reference that that on bioavailability that he shared. Uh, and I'll try to get from you, Professor Richter, that review article that you mentioned earlier. And for all the attendees here, then we'll we'll follow up with some resources. I've already posted into the chat uh, a link to your open access article um, from your Durham study, and I'll include that in the resources that we send out to to all the registrants um, afterwards. Again, my name is Michael Hull. Um, and uh, if you have any questions about uh, the work today, um, well, you should direct those to Professor Richter. But if you have questions about the technology, uh, rental opportunities, uh, soil analysis with Portable XRF, feel free to reach out to me. I'll put my email address in the uh, attendee chat. And you'll also, you can, you can find me on the Olympus website or you've obviously found me when you registered for the, for the email. Um, so I think uh, I'll give the last word to our presenters, Professor Richter and Ms. Gaglieri. Anything you want to say to our attendees? No, it's so great that there were New York City folks embedded in a list I didn't see. I certainly didn't see. Certainly, I didn't. Certainly glad I didn't talk bad about the Big Apple. <laughs> um, no, I, I, you know, Zoom gives us a lot of ability to do these kind of things, Michael, and I'm, I'm glad you're uh, making use of it. Um, this, this remote technology, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not for everything, but for occasions like this, it's really opening up a, another way to communicate and circulate. Um, yeah, so thank, I, all I have to say is thanks for, thanks for the opportunity. Our pleasure. Yeah. I would say thank you for answering panicked emails and phone calls about any XRF questions that we had. And um, to everyone who attended, thank you for coming and listening to us. And it's it's nice to know that we do great work, but when other people are interested in it too, it's a good feeling. So thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you everyone for, for joining today. And we'll send the replay link out uh, here shortly. Thank you, folks.